Hello friends, my name is Fallout, and I'm going to tell you right now, if you've never soloed a dungeon before in D2, or if you've never even attempted to solo a dungeon, today's video is for you. Why? Well, I know if you've never done it before, the thought of even trying to solo flawless a dungeon is probably laughable. You'd probably say, oh Fallout, hail to the no, I ain't esoteric, I'm not a PvE god, why even bother? But look, if I had to rank each dungeon in D2 for hardest to solo flawless, I'm happy to say that the brand new dungeon, Grasp of Avarice, is at the bottom by far. It's an entry-level dungeon for those who want to think about dipping their toe into challenging PvE solo content. If you're a skier or a snowboarder, GOA is the green trail difficulty. So what do you get for the solo flawless completion of a dungeon? You get a cool little emblem that you can put on and flaunt in-game to show that you're better than people you know. Small amounts of glory for a moderate amount of work? Yeah, maybe, but bragging rights are everything, so if you've never even thought about trying to solo flawless a dungeon, watch today's video and think about it. I assure you at least a few people out there will do it after watching today's video and you could be one of them. But real quick, I gotta give a shout out to the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh. If you've ever joined me live on stream, you know that I get very easily distracted by talking about food and my love of cooking. I truly feel that being more confident in the kitchen and cooking your own fresh meals at home is a huge mood booster. Enter HelloFresh. Let them help you with 50 weekly menu and market items to choose from so you can think less about what's for dinner and more about achieving your goals in the new year. With calorie smart and carb smart recipes, you can indulge in delicious meals without worry. HelloFresh uses fresh and pre-portioned ingredients. No more buying a huge pricey amount of whatever ingredient you're going to use in one dish and then never again. HelloFresh offers great recipes that you can choose from each week to break out of your culinary rut. They've got a ton to pick from too. Family friendly, calorie smart, pescatarian, and veggie options too. On top of that, each recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. With more five-star reviews than any other meal kit, you know you're in for some good food. Take it from me, brighten up your winter and have more fun at home by upping your cooking game. Whether you want to have fun cooking up meals with family and loved ones, or you just want to unwind yourself with a little 4-1 cooking, HelloFresh is the way. Use my link or go to HelloFresh.com and use code POG-FALLOUT16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts across six HelloFresh boxes plus free shipping. Gifts include free appetizers, free desserts, and free premium recipes. Don't forget to roll into my chat and tell me what you wind up cooking because I genuinely do want to hear about it. Big thank you again to HelloFresh. Okay, before we even get to encounter number one or overall loadout crafting, I want to quickly mention the two biggest reasons why most people fail. Reason number one, they don't practice beforehand. Now, if you're a seasoned dungeon vet, you could probably get away with just hard resetting each time you die because you know what solo runs are all about. If you've never tried it before, as someone who's solo flawless every dungeon in D2, hashtag humble brag, I highly recommend that you do a full solo run, dying as many times as you need to before attempting your flawless run. Here's why. If you keep hard resetting after every time that you die, you're only going to get a lot of practice on the early on encounters and very little practice on the final encounters. It would really suck for you to reset the entire dungeon multiple times because you kept dying on the ogre encounter only to finally get by it then immediately get destroyed on the sparrow portion. Before even attempting your first flawless run, you should go through the entire dungeon solo. Doesn't have to be in one full go, but you should be able to beat every encounter in the dungeon at least one time all on your own before stringing it all together. That way you're going to be much more prepared overall and you'll have a relatively equal amount of practice for each encounter. TLDR, do a solo run first, dying as many times as you need to, then attempt your flawless run. Reason number two why people fail on this dungeon alone, the goddamned Burdened by Riches debuff. The first time I ever even attempted a solo flawless run on this dungeon, I got all the way to the boss fight on my first try and was doing pretty well until I forgot to dump all of my debuff into the main crystal and went right ahead to the damage phase, forgot about it, and died. I forgot about the debuff! As long as you can constantly remind yourself during the big three encounters to really keep an eye on your debuff timer, you're going to be fine. All right, loadout time, aka let's start a big fucking argument down in the comment section. There's probably going to be a lot of, why are you recommending blank? I watched another streamer beat it with blank or I used blank. You know what? 
that's fine. Your loadout shouldn't be carved in stone because a lot of stuff will work in the dungeon. Let's talk very general for right now. Titans. You may have seen a lot of clips out there of people using the very overpowered one shot meme hammer build. You can rock that if you want, but I'd wager that if you're new to solo dungeon content, that might be a difficult technique to get a hang of. A much safer way would probably be to just go through the whole thing with a bubble titan and maybe the helm of Saint 14. That way you get a little damage protection if you run into trouble and you also have an extra 35% weapon damage during any boss fight. Again, many other options will work fine. Warlocks. I can hard recommend two options, either Radiant Well Warlock or Bottom Tree Void Devour Warlock. Radiant Well Warlock will be better for damage phase against any boss, but Devour will be better for staying alive while fighting against random trash during any boss fight. I gotta be honest, after soloing the dungeon on every class, I'm gonna recommend trying with Warlock if you can, because I found that to be the most easy for me. I did Devour the whole way through. Probably would have been much quicker with Radiant Well, especially during the boss fight, but oh well. For Hunter, you can go Camo for livability. Either top or bottom tree should work fine. You might run into trouble during the boss fights though. Remember that the cracked armor mod particle deconstruction does not stack with your tether. Therefore, if you're using particle deconstruction and a fusion rifle or a linear fusion rifle, your tether will kind of not help you any further. I found that doing it with Hunter, even with camo, might have been the most challenging. But to be fair, I did only try it with camo. Let's talk general armor mod picking. I usually view solo flawlessing a dungeon as a test of endurance. The mechanics aren't really that demanding, and the boss fights will not go to enrage if you take too long. Therefore, upping your livability is probably the most crucial thing, and I think you should try to go with charged with light and protective light if you have that. Taking charge and empowered finish are both going to be great to easily get you charged with light. Empowered finish especially, yeah, it does eat away at your super meter, but remember, if and when you pick up 10 engram debuff in one go, you will automatically fully charge your super, so who really cares if you lose a chunk here or there? You can also throw on stacks on stacks if you want for more charge, but yeah, protective light will do great at keeping you alive. Before each encounter, you should open your chest armor and make sure you have the appropriate armor mod equipped for the upcoming fight. During the ogre encounter, I would recommend times two void resist armor mods, but then during the sparrow portion, you should probably change that over to two times arc resist. Final boss fight can either be double arc or one sniper resist and one arc resist. I'll talk more about the boss fight later, but if you decide to use a sword for damage phase, i.e. the lament, I hard recommend doing that strategy if you've unlocked the Lucent Blade armor mod. That's going to give you an extra 35% damage output with your sword when charged with light. If you're playing a bubble titan, remember that Lucent Blade does not stack with your bubble, but if you're a warlock or especially a hunter, that extra damage output is going to be really great. Also, if you decide to go the sword route for damage, two mandatory armor mod picks are going to be Sword Scavenger and Passive Guard on your artifact. Passive Guard by itself is going to do a lot of work in keeping you alive during any big damage phase. I tried to avoid using sword during the boss fights just in case anyone out there didn't have access to Lucent Blade. TLDR, if you have Lucent Blade, I recommend you try a sword build, and if you don't have that armor mod, probably go for a linear fusion rifle and particle deconstruction. All right, I'm assuming you already know the base mechanics of the dungeon if you're attempting a flawless, and if you don't, check my original guide on how the dungeon works, link in the video description. But for overall general tips on each encounter, let's make our way through. Starting off, the Loot Cave Encounter. I've seen people using double special right here, including but not limited to Wither Horde and Cartesian Coordinate. You don't have to do that, but yeah, Wither Horde does work very well in the opening encounter. If you can manage to make your way into the cave and just repeatedly spawn camp with Wither Horde on the floor, the opening encounter should go pretty quickly. Cartesian is there as kind of a hard hitting backup and it has solar damage. One of the few shielded enemies in the dungeon is right here in encounter number one. Wizards trolling outside the cave with a solar energy shield. If you have a different solar weapon you'd like to make work here, that would be fine. If you also want to play the encounter at range, also okay, but Wither Horde does very well. Again, always keep your eye on the debuff counter on your HUD. It will be one of the few things that will break you in this dungeon, even if you've practiced every encounter. After the first encounter, you're going to do that whole fight the hive underground thing on the way to the switch puzzle. Remember two things. One, you can change your loadout at any point, so feel free to put on something with longer range. And two, take your time. You're not in any rush. When you're at that tricky part with the falling 
platform above a room that contains a switch you gotta flip, remember to not panic and trust that the in-game mantle mechanic will save you. It will. Okay, next encounter, the switch puzzle. Wither Horde should also do pretty good here, but remember that even though the Explodey Thrall are intimidating on paper, they're not gonna chase you beyond a certain point, which is kinda near the door when you walk into any of those rooms. You can totally stay back and hit them at mid-range with no problem. Also remember that there should be no reason for you to attempt any ultra dumb, very long range jumping. You don't have to try and fly all the way to the back room immediately. Take your time and go through the doors the normal way. Another tip, when the shrieker eventually pops up, you can shoot it through the holes in the chain link fence at the very back of the area. If you want a little more controlled aerial movement during the jumping puzzle area, put on a sword. In the next area with the scorch cannons, there's not much advice I can give other than to just take things very slow. There will be more wizards with solar shields, but do the encounter like normal. Pick people off from afar, you're gonna be fine. Okay, now we get into our first real encounter in the dungeon where probably a lot of first timers will fail, the ogre encounter. When you get to that ogre encounter, you should probably make sure you're equipping times two void resist mods on your chest armor. Also, again, some way for you to become charged with light, whatever you prefer and protective light. High recovery and high resil wouldn't hurt very much either. Remember, you can actually tank your intellect here if you want, because on 10 engrams picked up, you get a full super. Once again, I'm assuming you already know the full mechanics of the ogre encounter, but you scorch cannon, the doors open, you kill all the hive, bring the debuff back to the main crystal until you activate damage phase, then wail away on the big bad ogre. As mentioned earlier, if you have Lucent Blade and the Lament Exotic Sword, you can try doing that. In one of my attempts, I did the Lament Sword without Lucent Blade, and it took much, much longer, but it is doable. If you can't remember the Lament Sword timing, try the following. Charge your sword by blocking, then hit the Ogre with three light attacks, then a heavy attack. After doing that, let go of the block button and repeatedly whack away with light attacks until you see your charge meter is back to full, and then you repeat. When paired together with Passive Guard, you should be relatively tanky, so it's actually a fairly safe method. If you don't have the Lucent Blade armor mod, or if you just aren't comfortable with a sword, you can instead go with a particle deconstruction linear fusion rifle strategy. Regular fusion rifles like the Cartesian or the Null Composure will be fine for cleaning up the hive, and when it's time for damage, you can do a hard-hitting linear on the ogre like a sleeper simulant or whatever you got. Before you start damaging with a linear fusion though, try to remember to immediately ramp up particle deconstruction to max power by first hitting the ogre with a regular fusion rifle burst. Not really mandatory, but a quicker way to get to that max debuff. Some people try to damage the ogre with fusion rifles from right up close by the main crystal. You can definitely do that if you want, but I found it to be a little bit easier if you actually leave the main crystal area and head over to the railing up on the top right of the map. You have a bit more cover over there and you don't have to worry about getting rolled up on and stomped by the ogre. Always remember, even when you hear the noise to indicate it is now damage phase time, never leave the area until all your debuffs are gone. Sounds very dumb, but at least a handful of people out there are going to make that mistake. When you're trying to clear out the hive each time you open a door with the cannon, remember, you can be trigger happy with both the scorch cannon and your super. If you pick up every moat behind each door, you'll get it back right away. Hunters, use your tether each time you open the door. Titans, drop your bubble. Warlocks, drop that well. You'll make clearing out the rooms that much easier, and you'll get your super right back. Okay, moving on. Next, we have the Sparrow Encounter, and I know if you're trying to go flawless, this part can be fairly frightening at first. A lot of people out there are going to harp on the fact that if you don't have the always-on-time Sparrow, it's going to be borderline quote, undoable. If you don't know why, the always-on-time Sparrow is a glitched and is literally faster than every other Sparrow in the game, and no I'm not kidding, and B it has a perk where you'll get shot less by nearby enemies. So while it will be a little bit more difficult if you don't have the always on time, you don't need it. Because I'm a crazy person, I did the run one time on a green sparrow, which is weaker and way slower, and I got it done. A few quick notes though, putting on double arc resist on your chest piece for the sparrow encounter would probably be a really good idea. I've also heard some people mentioning equipping the risk runner for the sparrow run. Not a bad idea, but remember that you're only going to make you harder to damage from the nearby fallen, meaning that risk runner will do nothing to protect your sparrow from getting shot and blowed up. Overall, all the sparrow run might be hard to learn, but it's easy to practice. When you get to it on your initial practice run, especially if you've already died before during the ogre encounter, 
maybe practice getting the sparrow part done perfectly a few times. Meaning when you get to the big grav lift jump at the end, maybe wipe intentionally and start the entire encounter again over a couple more times to make sure you really, really have it down. If you have the always on time, I'd say just do a normal run where you never get off your sparrow. But if you don't have the always on time, you can try to practice getting off the sparrow at each location where there's a big clump of fallen shooting you and blocking your path. I will now play my full run of me doing the method while on that shitty green sparrow. I barely managed to make it through, but remember I'm intentionally using a very slow and very weak Sparrow, so your run will be much better, I'm sure. Can you blind nade them? We've been over that before. That is a really good idea, but not everybody has a blind nade launcher. There we go. We're out. That was a good one. That was a really, really quick one. Really, really quick one. Please go faster. Hit that button. Can't read chat right now. Hope you understand. God, this fucking green is so slow. Isn't there a blue? Oh, is there a blue? We're cutting it close here on this fucking green, dude. I can't imagine how much easier it would be when I finally put on an actual sparrow that can really ride. Dude, this thing is such a shopping cart. Go! Hurry! Oh, baby. Oh god. Why did it Oh my god. Dude, it launched me up at the ceiling. I didn't think we were gonna make it. Okay, the next encounter is the gravity cannon encounter, and this one isn't so much difficult on your own as it will be long and annoying. You know the deal though, fly to an island with the active servitor, dunk a debuff until the shield goes away, kill the servitor, and push its lifeless machine body into the grav cannon if it is aimed directly at the giant shield in the middle of the lagoon. A few tips here when running solo. If you have one, the risk runner works very well right here. Almost every enemy is going to come at you with arc damage. Damage. So take that damage, power up, and mow through everybody. Swords are also good to have here because it's an easy way to plow through enemies up close and you're extra hard to kill when rocking the armor mod passive guard. Just like before, remember to not be stingy with your super because every 10 engrams you pick up, it's going to come right back. Anything else you can do here to make sure you lean into extra health regen is going to be a good call. Warlocks, Radiant Well, or Devour is going to do great. Hunters, Camo is your friend, and Titans, you get your bubble and you have your top tree void melee ability to give you shields on a punch kill. Those definitely aren't your only options, but really whatever you can do to be more tanky, just go ahead and do it. There's no boss fight and no rush. Take your time. It's going to sound stupid, but again, more than one time I've died because after I killed a servitor, I immediately began the, oh, well, time to push your dead ass down the hill portion of the encounter, completely forgetting that I still had debuffs that needed to be dunked. Don't let that happen to you. Always keep an eye on your debuff counter and don't start rolling the dead servitor until you are completely debuff free. I know you have limited time to yeet the dead servitor, but it's way more time than you think. Don't rush and take your time. Finally, we move on to the boss fight encounter. Go into it expecting a battle of attrition for sure. If you're new to soloing content, you might wind up doing four or hell even five damage phases but that's all fine. As long as you play smart and play patiently, you're gonna lock up a flawless run. The most annoying part of the boss encounter when alone by far is going to be getting rid of the two mini boss jabronis, the shank and the camo fallen. Those two really suck to deal with and they have a boatload of health. 
Gathering moats and damaging the boss will be a cakewalk in comparison, believe me. Again, many loadouts will work here, but I'm probably going to recommend killing the two mini boss enemies from long range with a power weapon like a linear fusion rifle. I know that you mainly want to save your linear fusion rifle ammo for damaging the big bad boss, but as long as you have times two ammo finder mods on your helmet, you should probably find more power ammo as you go, no problem. If you want to play it really safe, you can just whittle down the shank and camo bro with your primary weapons or the scorch cannon. It'll take a lot longer, yeah, but remember you technically don't have to rush, there's no time limit. Keep in mind, you're gonna have to dunk 60 engrams into the main crystal before DPS phase. Try to keep track mentally of how much you dunk each and every time you try to hit that number exactly. For example, if you're at 59 engrams dunk total and you go to the middle to dunk 20 more, DPS phase is going to begin right away, but your dumbass is going to have to stand there for longer than you want while you continue dunking your debuff. TLDR, try to time it to exactly 60 if you can. For the damage phase, I know that when you're in a fire team, you usually damage the boss from the dead center by the crystal, but if you're soloing, I usually jump way off to the left to damage the boss. Mainly you do that so you're not likely to get shot by random fallen during the damage phase. In my runs, I jumped off to the left island where the moats drop, but you could also jump to the smaller platform closer to where the boss is. Remember, the shank and camo bro will come back out after each and every damage phase. Annoying, but they need to be your top priority every time. Do not attempt to dunk or even collect any moats to bring to the middle of the map until both those guys are dead. As long as both of them are off the field before you even attempt to dunk any moats, you're going to be much better off overall. For the final boss fight, I would recommend arc damage resist on your chest piece or sniper resist and probably a linear fusion rifle and a fusion rifle paired with particle deconstruction. I'm sure the sword lament and loosened blade strategy will also work here, but the linear fusion rifle can make it much more easy to deal with the shank and camo fallen in the middle. If you have solo flawless the new dungeon and I know a lot of people have already and you have a loadout that you would like to share or recommend to a first timer let me know what that is down in the comment section that way if anyone watching today's video wants an extra loadout recommendation per each encounter all they got to do is scroll down if you want to watch me do a full first time flawless run with no editing I will link that down below as a pinned comment good luck and remember to beat every encounter at least once on your own before attempting a full flawless run thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. <laughs>